Again, uh, good morning, everybody. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I see a familiar face that is out in the audience, and I'm so proud to, to see her back here today. And uh, uh, Julia is so glad to see you this morning, and uh, uh, love you. I know I've been calling and talking to you once in a while, trying to, to figure out what's going on and everything, and you were down in, uh, with, uh, what was it? The fever called, I want to say, a valley fever. Oh, no, you don't have it. It just comes back and bites you. Oh, so I'll I, I, I tell you right now, I don't know, but I know I, I would want it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, most definitely uh, uh, been praying for, for you and Tom and for everything that's going on uh, with you guys. <coughs> I know uh, it's been hard for... For Mary and I, we've been trying to get this house done, and just I never thought building a house would be so complicated. Uh, uh, getting all these contractors lined up and lined out, and then on top of that, dealing with the bank and <coughs> and everything. So, uh, but uh, anyway, we're we're uh, absolutely uh, trying our best to get everything situated and get this uh, done. Uh, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank God for the rain that we got. Uh, the other day, uh, I got caught in it on the way back. Like I said, I got a chance to go down and speak Veterans Day, and I got a chance to, uh, uh, you know, speak there. And uh, you know, first rattle right out of the box, it was great to know that uh, the again that the uh, principal there was a pastor, and he opened us up and they fed all the veterans and opened us up in a word of prayer and stuff. And it was wonderful to know that. You know, that uh, God is still in those schools out there, you know, and, and in these little small towns and, and stuff. So, uh, this morning, uh, we are going to be in Acts, Acts chapter 9, uh, and uh, our text is going to be Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 9. Uh, and this morning, I'm going to be talking about conversion. Conversion. Uh, so... Uh, what is conversion? You know, what is, what is conversion? So I, I asked myself that, and they, and they said, and, and why should we worry about it? You know, uh, those are the two questions that came to mind when I asked myself uh, what I wanted to, you know, what I thought the Lord wanted me to preach on, and uh, and it came up with conversion, and it says we take what the, the what it is is the Webster's Dictionary defines conversion as something that's converted from one use. To another, from one use to another, we take something that's being used for one thing and we change it so it can be used for something else. Okay, that's what conversion is. Like a, uh, all you mechanics out here, or, uh, or you know, that's been out there working, or uh, shade tree mechanics like me. If you have a tool and uh, it just didn't work right, you know, you try to convert it into something that's going to work. Well, that's what we're talking about. It says, now the first rule in the conversion process is that there has to be a need for the thing to be converted. There has to be something wrong with it in the first place, and there has to be a need for the change. Like I said, if that tool that you were using is not working right, you have to convert it into something that is going to be useful for you to allow you to accomplish the task at hand. Uh, so there has to be a need for the change. Remember that old saying, though, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? Well, today uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 9, uh, where we see uh, Paul, who is still Saul at this point, is going through a conversion. Okay? He's going through a conversion. There was a need for Saul to be converted and changed. And we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to talk about Saul's uh, conversion into the apostle that we know him as Paul. So I'm going to start reading there. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 9. It said, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? <clears throat> and he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when, he, and when he, his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank or drank. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray this morning. I thank you for allowing us to be in a free country, Lord, where we still have democracy, Lord. And Lord, we still uh, come to a place to worship you and to praise you and to sing to you, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you would just be with us and guide and direct us uh, each and every day as we go forth and stand boldly as Christians, as converted Christians into your name, Lord, that we uh, would uh, profess the gospel, Lord, and preach it to those that need to hear it. And Lord, we ask that you would just be with us today, be with those on our prayer list, Lord, be with those that are traveling, be with our pastor, Lord, uh, as we know that he's not feeling well, Lord, we ask that you would just be with him. Uh, get his health under control, Lord, so that he can come back and preach your word boldly to, Lord. We ask that you would just be with our congregation uh, as we come and we worship you, Lord, and we go out and tell others, Lord, help us to grow, Lord, so that we might confess your name to those that need to hear it. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right. So we see... Uh, the first thing that we see here is a huge difference between Saul in, in verse 1 and Saul in verse 8. Okay, so we see in Saul in uh, verse 1, we see that Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord and went to the high priest. He even went to the high priest uh, in order to get a letter so that he might be able to bring people of the way uh, to uh, justice. All right? and, but we see there in verse 8, it says uh, verse 8 where it says that uh, then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Uh, so we, uh, the next thing that we see, you know, we saw that uh, that Paul was being led like a child, wasn't he? At first, he was bold and he was going out and he was putting people in jail and and murdering them and uh, threatening them and everything just because they were believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see in verse eight that he's being led away. You ever heard that saying, "Blinded by the light"? Well. Paul had a personal, divine intervention with the Lord that blinded him for three days. It says, God's grace is often shown through powerful acts and what appears on the surface to be a catastrophe. <clears throat> Believe it or not, in life, good things can come out of bad situations. And at this point in time, I'm thinking Paul thought, wow, this is not good for me. I, I, I could see, and now, now I'm having to be led to Damascus because I can't see. But we can see here in a few minutes after we read further down in the, in the Scripture that a good thing came out of something that Paul thought was disastrous or Saul thought. First we see that, that Saul needed a conversion. And how do we see that? We saw that he was persecuting the Christians. We see that in, in verse 2, where it says he had asked a letter from the, uh, from the priest uh, in the synagogues at Damascus so that, so that if he had found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound 
to Jerusalem. So he wasn't discriminating, was he? He was just going, he, he said, hey, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. If you are of the way, then I will bring you in. So, when we talk about of the way, this is a description of Christians, of Christianity derived from Jesus' description of himself. We see uh, this is what Christians were called before they were called Christians. They were called of the way. And that means the way of salvation. That Jesus was the way of salvation. So they were called of the way. So here we saw uh, see Saul traveling down the road and Jesus does what? Jesus calls him out. Jesus calls him out. But what we need to understand here is this, uh, that is that Saul wasn't tormenting, uh, tormenting Jesus himself. You, you see where it says right here where it says in verse 4, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's important that we know right here in verse 4 that, that Saul was not persecuting Jesus himself. But he was persecuting people of the way. And that in itself was like him persecuting Jesus because it shows the relationship between Jesus and his church. Jesus and his church. So by Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me? That shows right there that Jesus is saying that, hey, if you're persecuting Christians, it's like persecuting me. It says, so, uh, what do we see next? It says, so he was trembling and astonished, said to the Lord, what do you want me to do? I believe if uh, a light shone upon me and I heard a voice, I'd be trembling too. And I'd fall down to the earth and I'd ask, what do you want me to do, Lord, as well? It says, by saying me, this gave Saul his first glimpse of a relationship that we have with Christ. That we're not alone and that Jesus is always with us. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, God says, I am in you and you are in me. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So it doesn't matter what trial or what tribulation you're going through. It can be just like this conversion of Saul into the Apostle Paul. You can go from a bad relationship into something good. This encounter was not, uh, it was all about Jesus and Saul. It was all about Jesus and Saul. It wasn't about no one else. And you know how you can tell that? Because right here it says uh, in this verse that, verse 3, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. It said it shone around him. No one else. But it also states there that uh, after he says, uh, Lord, what would you have me do? Um, it says that the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told uh, what you must do. But we also see that, uh, that the soldiers that were with him, they heard it, but they didn't see anything. But guess what? Saul saw Jesus in his glory. He saw him as a light that shone upon him from heaven. So that just lets you know that it was a personal divine intervention between the Lord Jesus Christ and Saul himself. It was personal. It says that in verse 7, it says that, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one.
Saul needed to see Jesus because it assured his role as an apostle. He was singled out. He was singled out among all that were there in the entourage and everything. The light shone upon him only. He was the only one that heard Jesus. He's the only one that saw the light. He's the only one that wound up blind. Couldn't see. They had to be led away by the people they could see. Like a child. Said that he was on the road to Damascus. Damascus is an ancient city, the capital of Syria, located 60 miles inland from the Mediterranean and 160 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And apparently it had a large population of Jews, including Hellenist believers, who fled Jerusalem to avoid persecution. That's why Saul was headed that way. Because there was a lot of believers there. People of the way that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that put their life in Jesus' hands. So Saul, like it says in <clears throat> verse 1, was there, still was, was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so he went to the high priest in order to get a letter so that he could take them and bind them male and female, to Jerusalem. It says, the light, appearance, the light from heaven was an appearance of Jesus Christ in His glory and was visible to only Saul. That just lets us know right there again that it was a divine intervention. A divine intervention. It says, in three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Verse 10 says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So we see here the reason why Saul had this divine intervention, this conversion, because Jesus said what? He said, but the Lord said, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Lord Jesus Christ said that if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, that things were going to be hunky-dory for the rest of our lives. No, he didn't say that. No, he didn't. He said that we will suffer the same persecution that Paul, that Ananias was told that Paul was going to be suffering. And today, you see it every day. You see it on the news. You see it out in uh, our public, in our society, in our small towns. You see it in the big cities. Persecution of Christians. You see it in third world countries where they're cutting their heads off and stuff like that. Shooting them. If you're a Christian, you will be persecuted. I guarantee it. It says right here in the Bible. (coughs) 
Verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Hence the conversion. Notice right there where it says that Ananias said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Lord says, I will come into you. He indwells His self into you. The Holy Spirit comes into you. He is your guide from then on. He says, There fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight, and at once he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And I'm just going to read one more verse. And I love this part right here. It says, immediately afterwards, it says, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Amen. What a conversion. What a conversion. There was a need for change. Wasn't there? We saw that in verse 1 where he is threatening with murderous threats. Okay? That uh, against the disciples. And he even went so far as to get a letter to back himself up. And then he had a divine intervention, divine conversion from Saul of Tarsus into the Apostle Paul. Verse 20 said, Immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God to a believer of the way. Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone that had been doing that being converted into a Christian and, the, and within three days standing in the synagogues preaching against them, uh, preaching about the very thing that he was against. Praise God, hallelujah. You know. But we see that he went from a, a, a person that thought he was doing what he thought was right. He went from, uh, you know, uh, demanding a letter from the high priest in order to, to bring these people of the way uh, to persecute them, to being led away like a child. And what does the Lord say that we need to do? Humble ourselves as if we were children, right? And Ananias. Ananias had heard the stories. He knew what was going on. He knew that Paul was a bad person. Right? And Ananias was one of the leaders of the Damascus church and therefore he was one of Saul's prime targets. That lets you know right there about Ananias' faith because he has spoke to the Lord and the Lord said, go. And he said, your servant will go. He said, and Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. 
It says, And Ananias went his way and entered the house and called Saul of Tarsus, a murderer, a murderer, his brother. He said, Brother Saul. Because he knew that God was fixing to convert Saul into an apostle to do his work, to proclaim his name. It says, Paul began his missionary preaching to the Jews, but his primary calling <coughs> excuse me, was to the Gentiles. God also called him to ministry to kings such as the uh, such as Agrippa and likely Caesar. And we know also by reading uh, reading uh, the Bible that Paul served the Lord faithfully throughout his whole rest of his life. I want to go over here to uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 says and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is called the Great Commission. This is our instructions. Just like Ananias was given instructions, this is our instructions. This is instructions that he gave his apostles. Go. It says... Therefore, and made disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. Amen. Again, I tell you this, and it's no lie. The Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can find it so many times in the Bible where He promises to be there. You just got to call on Him. He says, if you call on me, I will hear you. The conversion <clears throat> set forth many, many years of trials and tribulations for Paul. As we can see uh, there in, in Acts chapter 9 where Jesus says to Ananias, uh, it says, I, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul did so. But also Paul says that everything that he went through was worth it. He was a chosen vessel says there was a perfect continuity between Paul's salvation and his service. God chose him to convey, convey his grace to all men. Paul used this time, uh, used the same four words uh, four times. Uh, used it in Romans, <clears throat> uh, Corinthians, and in Timothy. And he preached to the Gentiles and kings alike. Jews as well. So you see, <clears throat> there was something wrong. It needed to be fixed. There was a need for the change. God used him. God chose him to be the vessel to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. That was the need. But I say to you again, remember that old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you believe that you're not broke, you might want to look in the mirror again because we're all, all short of the glory of God. I'm broke. 
I'm a sinner. I'm broke. I needed fixing. I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my life and to use me. And I stand here today proclaiming His Word. <clears throat> there was a need for my conversion. And all I can ask is for those of you that don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have any questions whatsoever, reach out to someone else and ask them about the Lord Jesus Christ and what being converted is all about. To be able to serve Him wholeheartedly, to praise His name, to sing glory to Him, to just imagine that the God that made everything, the stars, the universe, the men, the women, the animals, the trees, the flowers, <clears throat> to know that He came to this earth and taught what a glorious time that would have been to have been able to see Him. That He went to the cross who had never knew sin but bore the sins of every living person on this earth. And when He breathed His last breath, He, he said to, to God, it's finished. And as, as you know, well know, as he was on the cross, there was also what? Another conversion. Of the, one of the criminals that was hung there next to him was converted prior to his death. When he asked the Lord to forgive him, and the Lord said what? I will see you in my kingdom. At this time, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I uh, want everybody to, to rise up, turn over to hymnal 305. I'm going to be up here. Uh, we'll start singing. Uh, if, uh, if you want to come down and, and pray, I'll come down and pray with you. Uh, and uh, just remember that. Uh, you know, God touches each and every one of us every day. You just got to open up your heart, open up your ears, and listen. Go to that quiet place. Go to Him. Take your worries, trials, and tribulations to Him. Throw it at His feet. Believe me, He can handle it. He can take care of it. Just got to give it up. <clears throat> Sing uh, 305 on three. One, two, three. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And all God's children said, Amen. in a word of prayer, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you once again, Lord, we thank you for this day and these lessons, Lord. We thank you for this message that's been brought. Yes, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, Lord. Yes, Lord. We ask as we go our separate ways, Lord, and that we'll take your word with us, share it with other people, Lord, keep us safe and bring it back at the point of power in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.